So welcome everyone to our GT Neuro Seminar. We're very excited and fortunate to have Dan Polly from Harvard join us today and tell us about his latest work. Um, Dan did his PhD in California at Irvine at studying the barrel cortex, correct? And then did a postdoc with Mike Merzenich at UCSF um, and then started his lab at Harvard thereafter um, studying the auditory system. He's an associate professor in the Department of Otolaryngology in the Harvard Med School. He's been using a lot of different approaches to understand the basics of the auditory system uh, and how auditory dysfunctions such as tinnitus, hearing loss, um, are implemented at the level of the circuitry and how we can fix those things. So I think he's another really good example of all the intersections we like to have for our seminar series of neural circuits, systems, new technology, and how these can uh, address principles and functions and dysfunctions of the nervous system. So Dan, we're really excited to hear about your work today. Thank you. Thanks for the introduction. It's um, a pleasure to be, I would say here, but I don't know where we are, probably some server farm in Iceland or something. Wherever we are located, um, I'm happy to be connected with uh, all of you today and tell you a little bit about what we've been doing. Super. Well, um, I think, you know, talking with Bilal and learning a little bit more about, like, the um, type of people that tune into this seminar series um, and looking at the, um, the faculty expertise, things that probably there just isn't a lot known about the um, – huge amount known about the auditory system. There aren't a lot of people, with the exception of um, Robert Liu at Emory, who's really an expert on the auditory system, not a ton of in-house expertise on this particular modality. So, you know, part of what I wanted to do today was just to introduce you to uh, some of the newer issues and findings and discoveries and frustrations that have been happening um, in the auditory modality. Um, and, you know, one thing you can study, which has you know, certainly been a pop popular and venerable topic for sensory systems, is how does the coding work, right? How do we um, encode the essential attributes of the physical stimulus? Um, so uh, the cochlear hair cells are the sensory cells, and they basically convert these mechanical pressure waves into electrochemical transduction. Um, the spiral ganglion neurons are the primary afferent neuron, the auditory system, and their job essentially is like analog um, to spike conversion. And then signals go to the um, cochlear nuclear complex, um, where there's a lot of extraction of uh, monaural spectral and temporal features. The next step of the system, I mean, you're already noticing that we're still in the brainstem, right? We haven't left. And so if we're the somatosensory or visual system, you know, you, you're into the thalamus, like within um, one central synapse. But the auditory system, there's like a lot of connections that remain in the brainstem. Um, here we're showing the um, olivary complex, which is where um, binaural or spatial cues are first computed. Um, and then as you kind of winch your way up the system and ask, like, what are the essential features that are um, arise there de novo? Uh, well, you don't know. I mean, all these years of studying the auditory system, um, it has sort of defied this, like, uh, canonical feature that we're all kind of familiar with with sensory systems, where features of increasing complexity emerge at later stages of processing. And um, it's not for lack of trying, but if you present the simplest stimulus possible, a pure tone, it will drive neurons in the auditory cortex really well. Um, and if you present like the most complicated stimulus possible, like speech and competing speech, you'll get selective responses in the nerve. So sort of like the, the visual system model, which has been so instructive for understanding other systems. It has always been kind of a, a square peg in a round hole when it comes to the auditory system. So I, I just want to, um, I want to talk a little bit today about, you know, to what can we attribute the sort of the frustrations that we've had understanding what later stages are doing. I want to emphasize that I'm not, there have been a ton of really important discoveries. Um, I'm just referring specifically to coding. Um, there's a really wealth of literature in the auditory system in the realm of plasticity and how sensory signals are transformed from their physical attributes to meaning, how the system changes with learning or with sensory deprivation. And in many of those sort of plasticity questions, the auditory system is, is really um, far along and the understanding is pretty advanced. But 
Here I'm just talking about coding. And um, I'm also talking about, I'm not talking about representation. So you can find a representation of sound location in the cortex. Um, um, but I'm, what I'm really trying to focus on are like the initial computation, the first time that a feature arises, and then how the circuits like provide uh, the ability to compute that feature. So um, reasons why they haven't emerged, well, um, historically it's the system was studied with anesthetics or from animals that weren't behaviorally engaged or recordings that haven't targeted um, genetically identified cell types. And, and that's true, that's not a unique critique of the auditory system probably, but um, you know, we made a lot of progress on other systems without doing like um, two photon imaging of genetically targeted cell types or what have you. So I think there's something beyond these sort of simple methodological explanations. Um, one possibility is that given all this elaborate circuitry in the brainstem, there just isn't anything left to uh, compute. Um, but I think actually it's sort of the, the field has been sort of looking for complexity in the wrong places. And that's something I, I want to spend a little bit of time talking about today. The other um, big mystery in the auditory system is there's a second auditory system, um, a bizarro auditory system that instead of um, conveying signals from the cochlea towards the cortex, uh, conveys signals from higher stages down to lower stages, um, the centrifugal pathway as opposed to the centripetal. Um, so these descending connections are massive in the auditory system. And they go everywhere. Even the cortex will innervate the thalamus, the inferior colliculus. It'll send connections to the cochlear nucleus, the first stage of central processing. It'll send projections to the amygdala and to the striatum. Um, we understand, really understand only one component of this descending system. All of our cochlear bundle where, where um, neurons in the brainstem actually innervate the cochlea. So that's not something you see in the retina or in the somatosensory system, but these efferents um, play a really important role in gain control. They actually tighten the muscle that controls your middle ear, and they can change the uh, ability of those cochlear hair cells. So I think that all of the cochlear bundle we understand well, and then the rest is uh, um, or not sure. Um, so the second goal of the talk today will be to um, to tell you, uh, so yeah, I want to give you a primer on temporal processing. Um, I want to tell you about some new evidence we have for features that are emerging uh, de novo at later stages of the pathway. And then thirdly, I want to um, tell you about some work we've been doing on understanding this sort of first order branch of the descending pathway from the cortex to the thalamus, the corticothalamic cells. So, uh, right, so on to the primer then. Um, so. Sound is fast. You have, if you understand the auditory system, you have to begin with the fact that the physics of sound just, it's a fast signal to capture. Um, you know, normally the biological components are not designed to like encode things that, that oscillate this quickly. So um, evolutionary pressures have designed this really exquisite peripheral sense organ that can convert these atmospheric pressure waves into initially vibrations. That's the role of the middle ear to take this really rich um, acoustic signal, uh, music and, and conversation is all basically reduced to vibration on your eardrum, um, which is then um, transferred into the um, cochlea of the inner ear. And the cochlea is, um, by any standard, uh, just a marvel of engineering. It's an electro-hydro-mechanical force transducer signal amplifier, a frequency analyzer that outperforms anything that we can design in silico. And mostly, you know, it's just like a self-sustaining um, uh, water and proteins. I mean, what it can accomplish is truly um, unparalleled in biology. Um, it's sens sensitive to subatomic displacements with micro-mechanical response times, um, uh, spans three orders of magnitude and frequency. The, the uh, dynamic range of signal amplitudes that it can encode are 120 dB, which is a million million fold change in signal energy. Um, so it is, um, you know, it's a transducer. It converts these uh, pressure waves into electrochemical signals, but it is designed with one purpose in mind, which is speed. To encode these atmospheric pressure waves, it has to be fast, um, and it's and it has accomplished that. So moving on, um, let me just say, like, you know. The bigger challenge in hearing is that the rest of the brain 
doesn't go that fast, right? I mean, a neuron in other regions of sort of a garden variety pyramidal neuron in the cortex, if you inject current into it, it'll spike at like 10 hertz or something like that. Um, um, it can track like variations of signals, like maybe 10 hertz or 20 hertz or something like that. And so the auditory, the cochlea is, is uh, transferring signals into the spiral ganglion neuron um, at rates of like a kilohertz, right? And so, you know, one of the jobs of the auditory system is basically to change this like incompatibly rapid neural signal into a, a, a slower signal that can be merged with, with other senses. Um, that's sort of like a larger function of the auditory pathway. But at the early stage, um, you know, you might expect that in total silence, the input from the ear is near zero. It's not true. Um, the spiral ganglia neurons spike at 20 hertz or um, up to 100 hertz in total silence. Um, and that's different than other primary afferent neurons. Um, and like the trigeminal ganglion neurons, they, they barely spike unless there's a deflection of like a facial cutaneous receptor. The optic retinal ganglion neurons will spike spontaneously up to around 20 hertz in complete without any visual input. But the auditory um, primary neurons are spiking like crazy, even in silence. Um, actually, it's, think, it's thought it might reflect Brownian motion of like the um, stereocilia bundle. It may not be total noise. It could be some signal that we can't even measure. Um, but when you present a signal, um, these neurons can spike at over a kilohertz, so they can track these really rapid variations in the um, source signal. So the brain is basically, the auditory brainstem is just like facing like a torrent of activity from the auditory nerve. There's about 30,000 primary afferent neurons per ear in a human. And, um, you know, they're each spiking at tens to 100 hertz in silence and up to 1,000 hertz with sound. And so, you know, the, these, these parts of the brain have to contend with a type of excitatory input that most of the brain doesn't have to deal with. Um, and it needs to encode those features to extract these, like, critical features for hearing. And if you look at the brainstem, you'll see things that you don't see elsewhere in the brain. Um, here's um, a drawing of a first order neuron in the cochlear nuclear complex called a globular bushy cell. And just want to draw your attention to this presynaptic specialization called an in bulb of health. So it kind of envelops, it's, it, this is the auditory nerve uh, central synapse, which envelops these uh, globular bushy cells, ensuring high fidelity transmission. Um, here's another cell type in the cochlear nuclear complex called an octopus cell. And as opposed to the globular bushy cell, which gets only a few auditory nerve fiber inputs, which confer a very narrow frequency tuning, the octopus cell, as you can see, is, gets auditory nerve inputs from all across the cochlear frequency map. So unsurprisingly, it responds to broadband signals like noise. I mean, the point is that like function Selectivity for noise follows form, that like it gets these inputs from all across the cochlear frequency map, so of course it responds to broadband signals. Um, if, you, if you play a tone, so I think this is maybe a 400 hertz tone, and you record from a nerve fiber, so these are rastrograms. I use a lot of them in my talk, I hope you're familiar with them. Every dot is an action potential, and every row is different trials. So here, they're playing a tone at 49 dB, 59 dB, 69 dB, and you can see the nerve, a single nerve fiber is spiking. You could decode the frequency of that tone, right? You can just count the period in between the spikes and know that it's, I guess, like a 400 hertz tone. The thing I want to point out is that in the brainstem, the precision is actually better than in the nerve, um, and that's because these globular bushy cells have basically function as coincidence detectors um, to further refine the temporal precision of their spiking, which is truly exquisite and fast. Moving along uh, to the second order um, synapse, here we'll see the uh, calyx of health. So this is a really famous synapse in neuroscience. It's the largest synapse in the brain, um, drawn by Ramoni Cajal, um, and also more recently with fluorescence microscopy. And again, this is um, the connection from the cochlear complex out to uh, an inhibitory structure, the MNTB. And what the point is that like there is no chance that the MNTB neuron is not going to spike if one of these um, decussating excitatory inputs 
fires because look at that presynaptic terminal. It's just enveloping the postsynaptic cell. Here's um, the cell that the MNTB projects to the MSO. It's a bipolar neuron. And guess what it does? It gets inputs from either side of the head and computes the intraoral time difference of sound waveforms. My point is that, like, again, function follows form at the earliest steps of the auditory system. If you wanted to design a neuron that was going to get inputs from the left ear on one side and inputs from the right ear on the other side, it would look, you know, pretty much like that, right? I mean, it's like, it's beautiful that, like, each dendritic field gets input from, like, a different ear, and the computation follows that, like, the spiking is a function of the coincidence or the uh, coordination of the excitatory inputs from the two ears. So these neurons show exquisite sensitivity to interoral time difference. They're, the tuning for their preferred interoral time difference is on the order of like hundreds of microseconds. So I think I've, I've hopefully beat this dead horse enough that like when it comes to the auditory brainstem and the periphery, it's like the Usain Bolt of the nervous system. Like this system is built for speed. The easiest way to um, sort of capture the temporal precision is with this kind of a function where you play a uh, sound, you modulate the sound in time, so like wah, 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 and you look at how precisely the neuron can synchronize action potentials to the modulation rate of the sound, right? This is just a modulation transfer function. And so it might look something like this in the auditory nerve, and you could measure like the synchronization with like a vector strength metric or something like that. And take out one simple feature. What is the highest modulation rate to which this neuron will precisely synchronize its action potentials? We'll just call that the neural synchronization limit. And um, I'm just sort of like very coarsely schematizing like thousands of studies. Um, if you look at the neural synchronization limit across like the hierarchy, um, you know, it's over a thousand hertz in the nerve and the cochlear nucleus Periolus starts to drop, the midbrain, it's like a couple hundred hertz, the thalamus, just shut up hundred, cortex is about 10 hertz. So the question is always like, what's changing in, across the auditory hierarchy? Well, the most salient answer we have is sort of disappointing because what's changing is what's lost. It's, you know, it's mostly what we see is what neurons can't do, um, not what they can do, what not new things that they can do. So in terms of the acoustic signals and speech, like a lot of these acoustic features are fast, like the fundamental frequency, um, uh, notes of birdsong or phonemes and speech, um, and music, pitch cues and harmony cues. And a lot of these cues are like beyond what the cortex can synchronize to. Um, for scene analysis, localization cues and streaming cues, they're all kind of like too fast for the cortex, poor cortex. Um, and that's sort of like where we've gotten stuck as a field for like a while. Um, I think what's sometimes overlooked are the slow things um, because we're so like um, auditory system researchers are so proud of our Usain Boltness that we um, sometimes overlook the importance of things that are modulated at very slow rates like sentences or bouts of bird song. Um, music, um, we have rhythm um, and rhythms form over slower time scales or loops. Um, I'll give you an example. I'm not sure how loud the audio is going to be, so I would encourage you to adjust your own volume. If there's no audio, Bilal will tell me, right? Um, so here's like noise bursts arranged in a random interval. Bilal, thumbs up, you could hear that? Yeah, it's okay, going to sound like a typewriter. Yeah, okay, now here's the same noise bursts and the same intervals, only this time they're sequenced in a repeating order. So that rhythm kind of just like pops out, right? And while that's like really automatic, it requires that you're able to like integrate over enough time to know that it's repeating. Um, here's another example in the context of scene analysis. So here's an object. Um, see if you can hear it. A bubbling brook, something like that. Here's another one. Uh, my point is, I don't know if you hear them or not, my point is that um, in order to hear this bubbling brook or somebody writing on a piece of paper, 
it's not an instantaneous analysis. If you only analyzed, you know, a couple milliseconds of that signal, you wouldn't know what it was. Um, you have to integrate. And so um, it's kind of unknown where in the system this integration occurs. It could be that neurons that can go fast can also integrate, or it may not be that case. So our hypothesis was that, like, sensitivity to all these local features is sort of a bottom-up phenomenon. But the higher stages are really expert at computing or encoding the things that are too slow like, for these uh, the Usain bolts of the system to encode. So this is what we're going to test. Um, the work I'm showing you has just um, recently been um, accepted for publication in, in current biology thanks to the efforts of Minakshi, who really did some really complex, really technically challenging electrophysiology experiments. Um, so what Minakshi wanted to do was record at three stages of the pathway, the midbrain inferior colliculus, the auditory thalamus, the medial geniculate body, and the auditory primary auditory cortex. And Minakshi is like kind of crazy, like she flies planes and climbs mountains and like scuba dives, so she's, I guess she's busy, so she's like, I'll just do all of them at the same time. So she um, like worked on this preparation for a long time to put electrodes into all three of these brain structures at, at once in an awake animal. And there are advantages to, to that beyond time savings because now we can if we we uh, don't have to worry about differences between the structures like basically being like um, animal dependent differences. We're studying all them all the neurons at the same time. So she has uh, 364 channel probes. Um, so we have 192 uh, recording channels, so we can get you know dozens or hundreds of single units out of a single session. So. You know, we, this is um, a really simple stimulus. You just present a short burst of white noise. And again, this is a rastrogram. What you see is that neurons in the inferior colliculus will, will spike once or twice um, shortly after the onset of the noise. The thalamus, the spiking is a little extended. And the auditory cortex is just sloppy. It just sort of spikes for tens of milliseconds after the, the sound. And, um, you know, this is something that's been studied in other systems um, where people have worked on the idea of like neural spiking time scales. And the approach that's generally used is to take the autocorrelation function. So you basically take the peristimulus time histogram and look at a copy of itself that's delayed by different amounts of time. And you can compute how the um, autocorrelation decays, where you can use tau as the decay constant. And groups that have used this in other systems, for example, the non-human primate visual system, um, or the non-human primate somatosensory system, find that the time scales basically increase as you go up the hierarchy for vision or somatosensation. So we thought we would, you know, analyze that, and we could um, perform the same computation that were used in those studies. And here, I mean, again, the system's fast. So in the cortex, it's like 26 milliseconds for the cell is the is the, is the tau decay constant. And when we look across all of our recordings, um, you know, you can basically see that it approximately doubles between the midbrain. So we reason that that would kind of like, that's one of the reasons that like, it's hard for the cortex to do high speed processing. It's sort of, its responses to discrete stimuli are kind of protracted in time. So an easy way to test that is just to do paired pulse recordings, like really simple sensory neurophysiology. We play two noise bursts, and we vary the interval between them. And when we record from a single unit in the IC, you see that it can like really beautifully capture both of the two pulses, even when they're really close together in time. So we do like a basic decoder analysis. So this is a confusion matrix. So the decoder is trying to decode from a single trial what is the time interval between the two pulses. Here's the actual time interval on the x-axis. Here's the interval that's classified on the y-axis. It's a nice diagonal, pretty high classification until you get like down to like really short pulses that are separated by only a few milliseconds. And then um, the thalamic neurons are not as good overall, especially uh, when they're short and the cortex is just really lousy at doing this like rapid temporal feature um, coding. It's just these sluggish responses basically collide and it can't decode rapid events. Um, here are the group data in terms of the decoder accuracy for the vertical rate and then you can also just measure the threshold. What is like the, the shortest interval to which the neuron can reliably accurately decode the interval? And up in the cortex, you, know, you need about 64 milliseconds on average 
between the two pulses before the cortex can accurately decode what the interval was. And it's, a, it's you know, less than two milliseconds in the, in the midbrain. Okay, everything I told you is, you know, essentially known. Um, you know, what, I, what we did was first reiterate that, like, the earliest stages of the pathway are good at doing local temporal processing. So now comes sort of the, the novel part where we say, well, what good is, are the later systems, um, what good are they? So um, I want to go back to this like typewriter um, example. So in a random arrangement, it sounds kind of well random, and you hear this rhythm when they're when the intervals are sequenced into a fixed uh, arrangement, right? So. It, the nice thing about that stimulus is it's the same stimulus we just used for all these studies. It's a short white noise burst. And as long as we put the bursts so that they're at least, you know, 100 milliseconds long, we can get rid of the, like, forward masking problems and just see if maybe the cortical neurons can, like, are sensitive to the difference between random and rhythmic arrangements. So the way Minakshi arranged the experiment is this way. There's, like, a baseline period to adapt the neuron just to get rid of like the initial spike rate adaptation. And then there's um, 25 cycles of this like repeating sequence. So she has, she chooses four intervals that separate um, the noise bursts. And those intervals are then like repeated cycle after cycle in the rhythmic stage. And then when she gets to the random stage, she takes the same intervals, but just randomizes their arrangement for each cycle. And here, the timing of the noise burst is shown as the gray line. So here's, a, here's 20 neurons recorded at the same time in the midbrain. Um, when the intervals fall into a, re a regular repeating sequence, the neuron spikes to each noise burst. And when it's random, it spikes to each noise burst. These, this ensemble is basically agnostic about whether these noise bursts are occurring in a random arrangement or in a fixed patterned arrangement. Um, more or less the same for the thalamus, but in the cortex, you can clearly see that the ensemble is doing something different when the sounds are presented in, in a repeating pattern than when they're presented randomly. Um, in a pattern, the responses look like they're dampened, basically, like everything's more precise. And here, when it's random, is more like what I've already told you about the cortex. It has this kind of protracted response and sloppy precision. So I introduced that time scale analysis to you earlier for a reason, because we're going to use it again here, only we're going to quantify the uh, decay constant of the spiking for spikes that occur either in the random stage or the rhythmic stage. Uh, here's just an example of how we do it for these three units, and here are the group data. So what we see is that if you look at these scatter plots where we for each cell, we have the time scale during the rhythmic on the Y, the time scale during the random on the X, and this, the data points are more or less clustered on the line of unity for the midbrain and the thalamus, but in the cortex, they're mostly below the line of unity, which means that the time scales are, are more rapid when the noise bursts are arranged in a pattern. Uh, another way to plot those data is just calculate the asymmetry index for the time scales and you know most of the neurons in the cortex are shifted over in that direction and not so for the subcortical. What's really cool about this is that there isn't a change in the firing rate. So the, in terms of the number of spikes that are elicited by noise bursts that occur in the random or rhythmic stage, there's no difference overall in any brain structure. So it's not that there were, this isn't like adaptation in the sense that the spike rates are adapted to repeating stimulus. It's something different. What we're showing here is that the spikes, their arrangement in time is changing um, when it's random or rhythmic. And uh, I'm not showing you the data, but that's actually sufficient to decode um, whether the stimulus is random or rhythmic. Another uh, kind of obvious question is like, okay, that test was with a sort of simple short sequence. So there's only four intervals per cycle, and then it repeats. And that takes 800 milliseconds to occur. 
What if there were more intervals? What if the pattern was more complex? And what if it took longer before it repeated? So here's an example of a test with eight intervals per cycle, um, which sounds like this. And here's 12. So with eight, most of you could probably hear that there was like a repeating structure. With 12, it's pretty tough. Um, and so we tested these mouse neurons. And with eight, the effect is weak. It, it's not significant by the statistics that, I mean, we were pretty conservative with our statistical criteria for significance. It's, it's weak. With 12, it's not there at all. So it looks like this integration itself has limits. For us, it was um, it worked in the cortex when the cycles were 800 milliseconds long. But when it were longer than that, we didn't really see it. OK, so I just want to kind of um, summarize um, the first couple parts of the talk. Um, we, I began by kind of introducing you to the like, bizarre world of the auditory brainstem, these remarkable um, biophysical and morphological and synaptic specializations that um, make these neurons like these really incredible high-speed processors um, in the brain. And then um, you know, we, the question is, what features click okay so the 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 cues to know where a sound occurs in space are not captured in the auditory periphery they are computed centrally right the the cochlea is not two dimensional like the retina or the skin there is no there is no information about x and y or z um, the information about where an object is on the horizon comes from a comparison of the signals between the two ears and like that's clearly computed um, in the brain and more specifically in the superior olivary complex. And after that, it's not like really clear that any feature is computed de novo after the superior olivary complex. Our features changed absolutely. Timing codes are converted to rate codes. Some features are refined or more strongly represented in the cortex, like pitch, than in the brainstem, but de novo computed. There really isn't much evidence for that. So, um, you know, I sort of affirmed that when it comes to encoding like rapid local features, the advantage goes to the earlier stages where the IC was able to better decode these um, intervals separating consecutive noise bursts in the cortex. But um, we provided evidence for something that is computed at later stages, and it, we didn't see any evidence for sensitivity to these slow rhythmic features in the midbrain. Um, we see a hint of it in the thalamus, and it's like quite clear in the primary auditory cortex. So um, these findings show that uh, low-level auditory neurons with their fast time scales are good for encoding local features, but not the gestalt. And you know, in vision, the gestalt refers to space, right? There's like a goose, and then the gestalt is a flock of geese. Um, the auditory system is like not about space or spectrum, maybe. It's like more about time. So complexity or gestalts in hearing are, I would argue, like in the time domain, that the gestalt is like is features that are distributed over longer time scales. And it could be that the cortical neurons, while they're not specialized to do the rapid processing, they, they are specialized just for a different purpose, which is to integrate over long time periods, which affords them the sensitivity to features that are missed by earlier stages of the pathway, which are all about high resolution processing. So one like, kind of curiosity is like, so the time scale that we measure, like over what period of time does the sound evoke spiking decay for a discrete stimulus? It's, you know, it was like around 20 milliseconds in the cortex. and in order to be sensitive to whether these noise bursts are repeating or are random, you have to be sensitive to 800 milliseconds. So that's a mystery. Like we we don't know how this works yet, right? It, it isn't simply the case that like oh well the particle A1 timescales are so long that like the entire repeating interval falls within a timescale. That's not that's not what's going on here. Um, the cortical neuron, it may itself be sensitive to the regularity, 
that's distributed over 800 milliseconds in a way that we can't see with an extracellular recording electrode. Or um, it could be that it is the readout of a different system that's really sensitive to these really long time scales. And you know, the fact that like the manifestation of the sensitivity isn't a change in rate, but rather a change in the way the spiking is dampened over time um, might be a clue. So here's like sort of a canonical cortical circuit. It could be somatosensory, visual, or auditory cortex. You know, first order thalamic input to a uh, pyramidal neuron. Um, I guess that's weird. The, auditory, the rodent auditory cortex doesn't have granular cells, so there's no granular layer. They're pyramidal cells. Um, that's just a uh, tangent. Um, and then, you know, we have these like larger pyramidal neurons, the deep layers that send their outputs to faraway places. We've got fast spiking neurons. By the way, the fast spiking neurons don't show any sensitivity to the repeating patterns. But you have these other neurons, like uh, somatostatin expressing neurons or NDNF expressing inner neurons that synapse onto the more distal processes of the pyramidal neurons. And, um, you know, they're kind of a point of interest. If you're thinking about a local circuit that could um, dampen or change the spike timing without changing the rate, um, that might be um, one possibility. Um, it's also possible that this, the unit that's sensitive to these like slow repeating structures isn't a cell type, but rather it's like a distributed circuit. So one example is like the corticothalamocortical loop. So we have cells in layer six that synapse back into TRN and the first order thalamus, which then project forward. And, you know, there's work from um, like Scanziani lab that you can get a lot of these like dampening effects through this like thalamocortical thalamic loop. So that's, you know, another possibility. We don't really know the answer to that. Um, but that sort of takes me to the final part of the talk today, which was the descending system. And like I mentioned, um, you know, we really want to focus now on like what what are these projections from the cortex to subcortical stations doing in the context of um, active listening. Now the anatomists have been aware of the descending system for over a hundred years. Here's a drawing from Ramonica Hall, who um, very astutely noted the 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 presence of the terminal ramifications of the corticothalamic or descending fibers and asks, you know, what are the role of these fibers? Do they transport some form of energy from the brain, the rapid accumulation of which in the sensory stations is necessary, the passage of ascending nerve currents? So, um, yeah, he always gets my vote for if there's one human being that ever traveled in time, um, it would be Ramonica Hall because he's just has just remarkable insights into the workings of the brain with really limited, limited information. Um, so here's, again, just to kind of, I know people work in other systems, so um, in the primary visual cortex, we have two classes of neurons that innervate the thalamus. Um, cells in layer five that synapse into the sort of higher order thalamus, LP, but also send terminals, um, collaterals into the superior colliculus, the striatum, and uh, AOT. Primary somatosensory cortex, you also have, oh, sorry. Then there's cells in layer six that synapse in TRN and the LGN, and they have some weaker input into the higher order thalamus. In the somatosensory cortex, same, same idea, different acronyms. Um, layer five neurons drop collaterals <clears throat> in the higher order uh, thalamic nucleus, the POM. Um, that's for the uh, uh, barrel cortex. Um, and then they drop collaterals in APT. In layer six, they innervate TRN and VPM with weaker inputs to POM. So we, we needed to know if the same sort of um, dichotomy of first order and, and higher order layer five versus layer six um, projections existed in the auditory system. So here's an anatomy experiment. We use the NTSR1 Cree line, which labels uh, only corticothalamic cells in layer six. And into this mouse injected a virus. And the point is that you see cell bodies localized to layer 6A and axon terminals, you know, really dense axon terminals in the auditory thalamus. We don't see any terminals in the midbrain or any terminals in the striatum or the amygdala with this mouse line. 
Um, here's like sort of an intersectional virus approach. So we inject a retrograde virus like CAV2 or AAV retro into the, into the midbrain, the inferior colliculus, and then a Cree dependent um, virus into the auditory cortex. And you see, again, now we have those cells in, in layer 5B, not layer 6A. Um, and the axons, of course, they're in the inferior colliculus because that's where we injected the uh, retrograde virus. The question is, where else are those axon terminals? And so the same set of cells are also dropping collaterals in the higher order auditory thalamus, the dorsal subdivision of the medial genetic. But we also see their axons going um, to the atum and to the lateral amygdala. So um, this is really consistent with what is seen in the visual and somatosensory cortex. Um, a layer six cortical thalamic system that primarily innervates the first order thalamus, the MGDV and the TRN, and a layer five cortical thalamics that drop collaterals and higher order thalamic subdivision on their way to many other places. These two um, types of cortical thalamic cells have been studied extensively, um, especially in the visual cortex, especially in slice preparations. And there's a lot of data that's been compiled over the, year, uh, over the years about what makes these two cell types different, which sort of culminated in um, Murray Sherman uh, and Guillory's um, sort of dichotomization of them as drivers and modulators. So they have all these different synaptic and intrinsic and morphological properties. Um, but uh, we don't actually know hardly anything at all about their sensory response properties um, because they've hardly ever been recorded from in vivo. So that is something that a postdoc in my lab, Ross Williamson, wanted to remedy. So what Ross did was express channeloidopsin either in the SR1 mouse line um, to, to label the layer six cortical thalamic cells so he implanted an optic fiber in the thalamus and optogenetically stimulated the layer six axon terminals, or he injected the, a retrograde tracer into the inferior colliculus um, and a credependent opsin in the cortex and optogenetically stimulated the um, midbrain terminals. So this was his way of, of getting targeted recordings from either the layer six corticothalamic or these layer five corticofugal cells that project to the thalamus in the midbrain, among other places. Now, how does he know that he's got one of them on his recording electrode? Well, when you sh present a very brief one millisecond burst of light, you just barely open the channel in the axons, you get sort of two different things when you record from the cell bodies in the cortex. You sometimes get something like this, a very neat, orderly, brief response, or something like this, which is delayed and distributed. And Ross reasoned that that spikes, optogenetically activated spikes like this are direct recordings. So this was a cell whose axon terminals were directly stimulated. And whereas this probably reflects polysynaptic activation through cortical circuits. So to test that, he um, did an experiment where he blocked all the local synaptic transmission in the cortex, leaving only the direct antidromic activation intact and computed the, um, the first spike latency jitter and you, again, like with, without MBQX, you get these two modes, this like high jitter mode and this low jitter mode. And after MBQX, the low jitter mode remains, which confirms that if when we see this kind of spike jitter, that's a directly tagged cell. So these are the distributions that we get, you know, when we record in awake animals without the drug. And we use that as a basis for defining when we have directly photo tagged antidromically phototagged, a layer five corticofugal cell or a layer six corticothalamic cell. And, you know, time is short, so I'm not going to dwell on these points too long. So we have a basis now for, for making targeted recordings from two different types of these descending neurons. And now, great, right? But now the question is, okay, what do we want to learn about them? We want to learn what they do, but like, what does that mean? So, you know, we're not that creative. You know, the first thing we thought was like, let's play sound. I mean, it's, they're in the auditory cortex. Um, there's the suggestion in other systems that the descending uh, corticothalamic cells basically don't respond to sensory inputs, but only non-sensory factors. So um, I'm, this is a really beautiful paper that Ross um, published. There are important differences between the layer five corticofugal and the layer six corticothalamic, but I'm going to like, I'm not going to dwell on them right now. 
they both respond to sound, and so do other neurons. So there are differences, but they're di differences of degree, not di differences of kind. So it doesn't really tell us like what is the uniquely important or different thing that deep layer neurons that project subcortically do from other types of neurons. That that um, question wasn't answered by just presenting sound. We can get some insight into it, not by looking at the response to sound, but by looking at the way that neurons in the column respond to the optogenetic laser stimulus. So here is um, you know, a 32-channel probe just spanning the deep layers. Here we've, we're optogenetically activating the midbrittles of the layer 5 corticofugal cell. And you get these really, this is a PSTH, you get like a really brief burst of action potentials only in layer 5, and that's how we photodetect these cells. When we do it on the NTSR1 line, the layer 6 corticothalamic, you just get spikes like everywhere. Like these cells are amazing. You stimulate their axon terminals and the cortical column goes haywire, for lack of a better word. I mean, there's just all these waves of spiking and suppression and spiking. So in that sense, the layer 6 are categorically different. The, like, the firing rates that are elicited by the optogenetic stimulus are not different but their effect on other regular and fast spiking neurons in the column are really different. So here's just like the, the uh, response to these cells being activated. And in layer six, you get really strong responses to both regular and fast spiking neurons. Optogenetics has its assets, but also its drawbacks. It's not realistic. It's not, it's not a realistic kind of a stimulus. So we wanted to, like, again, we photo tag the neurons. Now we wanted to, like, drop the optogenetic stimulus. And we play this, like, rich, varied, complex sound, which um, called the dynamic random chord. And Ross just looked with this sort of, like, continuous sound stimulation. Do the layer 6 corticothalamic spikes reliably precede um, spiking in other fast spiking units, which was suggested from the optogenetic result? And they do, right? So here there's like no laser evoked activation. Layer five cells, their spiking like really isn't correlated with other spiking in the column. Um, they don't drive um, cells. If anything, they collect spikes. They, they spike after other cells spike. But the layer six corticothalamics, their spikes precede fast spiking spikes. So um, you can see that the peak of the cross, -co cross covariance function is shifted to the right a little bit. So that just confirms the result here that layer six corticothalamics drive fast spiking neurons as well as regular spiking neurons. So going back to this table, um, what this anatomy and the sensory response has told us is that the layer five corticofugal cells have distributed subcortical targets, they're sluggish, they're broadly tuned, they have dense coding, they have weak intracortical drive, and their spiking lags local fast spiking units. So we can just call them like broadcast neurons, like they pool signals in the cortex and they broadcast it out to other stations in the nervous system. The layer six corticothalamics, they only go to the forebrain targets in the thalamus. They are rapid responses, narrowly tuned, sparse coding, strong feed forward intracortical drive. And their spiking leads fast spiking units, which makes them, well, it doesn't tell you, you know, that, that doesn't give us a label, right? It's just, they're different than the layer fives, but I don't, we don't yet know what they are. Um, so I want to spend the remaining time talking about some new experiments on these cells. One thing that immediately captured our interest, shown here as a cartoon, is that the layer six corticothalamics have axons that remain in the cortical column and another branch that goes down to the thalamus. In both cases, they synapse onto both inhibitory and excitatory cells. In the thalamus, their axons bifurcate onto TRN, which are all GABAergic, and the first order thalamus, which are glutamatergic, all glutamatergic, in the rodent auditory system. In the cortex, it's a mixture of fast spiking and regular spiking. Why would you design something like this? Like, that's weird, right? That's like pushing the gas and the brakes at the same time. And what, how is this useful? How, that seems to be an important clue. We um, were inspired to even begin these studies by this sort of seminal paper from the Scanziani lab, where, you know, if you take this, NTSR1 Cree mouse and express channel redopsin in those layer six cells, record from a layer five cell. Now, the, the corticothalamic cells are glutamatergic, but when you activate them, the effect on some other layer five neuron is all suppressive, right? Layer six suppresses 
not themselves, but through fast spiking networks. And so if you play a visual stimulus, here's the orientation tuning. With layer six activated, the tuning is like divisively scaled down. So we were excited to like replicate this result in the auditory system. And you know, we're just like, oh, like why can't it be easy, right? So we do essentially the same experiment. I mean, our animals were awake, but otherwise it's the same mouse line. Everything is the same. You record from a layer five cell with uh, with chondrodopsin and layer six corticothalamics, and like it's not suppressed like it is in the visual cortex, it's like activated. And if we, um, I should say that like this isn't the only story about these cells, like there's a different and I think emerging um, line of evidence that they these isn't they don't do one thing, right? These layer six corticothalamics, they by virtue of how their spikes are arranged in time both rate and timing, they can actually like dynamically control synapses to either favor inhib the inhibition component or the excitation component. So um, we can show that too. If we just derive like a tuning curve, um, we, can sh we can play uh, tones at different times relative to corticothalamic activation. You can see that when the tone is presented, when the layer sixes are activated, there's sort of this like additive um, change. So it's not like the visual system, but it's changed. But if, this, if the tone is presented just after the laser is turned off, it's divisively scaled. And that's a lot like what they show in V1. And um, if you wait an even longer delay and play the tone 150 milliseconds after their activation turns off, you get like multiplicative scaling. So there's like a lot of different modulations that you can get out of this system. I'm um, we're gonna skip a few slides because I've spent too long talking about the anatomy, and I want to share some of like the more recent work with you. Or I completely run out of time. You've got about five minutes left. All um, right, it's up to you if you want to go through it or leave time for a few questions. However, you want to do it. Well, um, shoot, I'm sorry I misbudgeted my time. Um, I'm just gonna make one last point. The question is, what do the layer six corticothalamics do in vivo during behavior? We had reason to believe that because they modulate sensory tuning, not while they're on, but after, and perception after they turn off, that it would be really neat if these cells were activated before a stimulus that was anticipated. And we did some um, experiments to measure in a behaving animal, when do layer six corticothalamic cells activate? And um, is it before the movement that produces an anticipated sound? And here's just, I'm gonna show you one piece of data from two photon imaging of these cells. In layer two, three, you don't see any layer two, three parameter neurons that like are activated by movement that produces a sound. But when you, we image the layer six corticothalamic cells, we can see that their activation ramps up with unit recordings hundreds of milliseconds before movement. Um, with imaging, you can see it, you know, hundred, again, hundreds of milliseconds. So these layer six corticothalamics are activating well ahead of the movements that produce sound. And we wanted to argue that um, this might sort of prime the column to process anticipated sounds, um, either to suppress them or to enhance them. Um, so I, again, apologize for like not totally closing the loop here. The last piece of data I'll show you um, relates to how do they get this like motor related input that makes them like adaptive, flexible and anticipatory gain control. And so we just did some rabies tracing of these layer six corticothalamic cells in the auditory cortex. We don't see any inputs from M2, which have been described from Rich Mooney's lab onto other cell types. We see a lot of inputs from the globus pallidus, um, the external um, segment of the globus pallidus, um, which you know, outnumber the motor cortex inputs by like a factor of 10. So one sort of thing I'll leave you with before taking a few questions is like there are multiple loops. The corticothalamic loop is well known, um, but there also might be like a corticobasal ganglion, uh, ganglia loop where layer six corticothalamics get input from GP and perhaps synapse onto the corticostriatal cells, which form a loop that way. So 
maybe Ramonica Hall was right that this is like a way for motor signals to like basically um, change the um, the af feed forward afferent transmission of sensory signals. So um, Minakshi did the work in the first part of the talk, and the corticothalamic findings were done by uh, Cameron Ross and Way. Thank you all for your attention. I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks a lot, Dan. That was great. Um, so we've got uh, some people might shoot off at 12.15 to go to class or whatever, um, but we have time for a few questions. If you want to, I didn't see any in the chat, so if anyone wants to unmute to ask a question, please go ahead. And while we're waiting, I'll jump in with a question. So um, I was wondering if in the first half of the talk where you had the triple site recordings, I was wondering if you've looked at the relationship of firing in the three areas at the longer time scales, right? So if Cortex is doing some sort of pattern recognition or longer time scale integration using, you know, the question mark circuits in the second half of the talk, is it somehow feeding back and changing changing response properties lower down? Yeah, I, I think we kind of like underutilize the triple recording. Um, it seems that you could gain some insight into like these like communication that's flowing in multiple directions uh, between these stations. I, you know, the stimulus paradigm we used, there was like a lot of sounds occurring in pretty high density. So it's, it's a little bit hard to like separate out like the sensory drive from like yeah. the, like to do like noise correlations or something like that. And there wasn't, enough richness in the stimulus to do signal correlation. So I feel like um, we're kind of stuck on that. We have the data set, and I'm not sure what we're going to do with it. We, it's actually um, going to be available online. Um, but I, I feel like, yeah, we've kind of underutilized the triple recording, given how, how hard it was for me not to yeah. register. Um, and I have to admit that, like, we don't have, like, a really clear sense of what we're going to do next. But if you do, um, let us know or just take the data and let us know what, what comes out of it. <laughs> <laughs> Another couple of questions. I see Robert. I see Gary. Robert. Yeah. Hey, Dan. Uh, great talk. A very nice, rigorous work. Um, I look forward to talking to you a little bit later this afternoon. Um, let me ask, though, uh, with the rhythm work, which is really elegant, do you ever think about that in like a context of predictive coding where for the rhythmic stimuli, you have very, um, at a perceptual level, something that's very predictive um, perceptually versus the kind of noisy intervals where it's less predictive um, and you see this kind of difference in, in the coding. Does, do, you, do you think about that result in some way reflecting something about the predictive nature of um, the responses in auditory cortex? Thanks, Robert. Yeah, it certainly is tempting to use the P word, isn't it? I mean, it, yeah. it's like, uh, um, I guess I've been like conservative. I mean, there is a basis for prediction in that signal, no question. Um, I was sort of, we we wrestled with how heavy, heavily to lean on prediction. I, I haven't because for me, like proof of prediction would be behavioral. You know, we need to, I need to, would need to know that the animals actually, the mice perceive the pattern. Um, for me to say that it's like predictive, because for me the word is sort of like a psychological term. So um, we we thought we would study that, and we started a whole set of behavior experiments to ask whether mice could, using an operant behavior to distinguish between the repeating pattern and the random. Um, they have they're still sort of ongoing, but they haven't been going very well, to be honest. So I, it's it's hard to get a mouse to like accumulate sensory evidence before telling you what it hears. Mice are good at doing detection tasks. Um, so we're using like motorized stages to delay the operant response. We don't know whether mice can't hear this or whether like we're not they're, not, they're telling us something else, but the evidence is not like inordinately clear that they're using it as like a predictive cue. Um, the other thing we could do to your point was like, we can titrate the randomness. Um, so we, and, and that's a good idea and something that's kind of like um, underway. Um, we don't really know like, not like, it's not very clear yet, so I'll just have to tell you about that later. But I, I feel like I've, 
I'm aware that predictive coding is out there, and I'm just like hesitant to. Okay. One uh, question, if we have one. Yeah, I, I have one. So I, I'm, I think, Dan, uh, really nice talk. I think uh, really um, just fantastic body of work. I'm look, looking forward to talking to you later. Um, and I think you partially got into this in your, your last answer about the behavioral experiments, because I was thinking about all sorts of behaviors that, that you'd want to get into here. And I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts on the potential role in attention, right, that people classically have associated with the corticothalamic uh, feedback loops. Yeah, thanks, Garrett, for that question. Yeah, I, um, believe it or not, I did show some discipline and not include some things on my slides. So <laughs> some of the things that got left out were some behavioral or behavioral studies that we've been doing. So we've, we've been sort of, um, I guess, be, be, with the auditory corticothalamics, they, it's so interesting that they exert strong effects like after the um, their volleys of spiking have ended by virtue of their like distributed connections onto like both excitatory and inhibitory neurons we were always sort of like smitten with the idea that that might be useful for like anticipatory process. so that's like a type of attention not spatial attention but like temporal attention yeah. so we have evidence in mice that like that you know mice can use temporal anticipatory cues to improve their recognition of like Features that are repeated in time at regular intervals, or um, um, self-initiation can improve their frequency um, resolution. And so, um, you know, it's we've we've really wanted to see what the corticothalamic cells are doing in the context of those behaviors. What what we found was that like mice are they lick the like initiation spouts and the lick spouts like they're sort of antsy and fidgety before they get the reward, they'll sometimes like lick the spouts. And so we just asked like, okay, well surely like the licking itself isn't like doing anything to these cells, right? And the answer was like a resounding no, that like licking itself like seemed to really strongly activate these layer six corticothalamic cells. Like they're getting like some kind of like a motor corollary input. Um, and that's not, again, like there's some work out of Rich Mooney's lab showing that like there are like motor inputs onto these layer six cells. So now, the behavior we used, the movement did produce an anticipated sound. So we can't really say, like, was it the anticipation of reward, the anticipation of sound, or just movement per se that caused their activation? And that's kind of where the project ended. But, like, you know, you approach it with, like, a really clear idea in mind of, like, what these cells might do. We learned something a little bit different that there, and maybe it's because of these inputs from Globus pallidus, that there's, like, like a really, seems like a really privileged um, drive for movements that um, produce sounds. When the animals run on a treadmill, they're not really activated at all. So it's something about like facial movements that produce sounds. That's that's where we're at with that question. Thank you. Okay, I'm sure there's tons of other questions. Uh, but we're a little bit over time, so I'm gonna stop it for now. Um, but if you have questions for Dan, please get in touch with him. And I want to thank him again for a really excellent talk, really enjoyable. Um, and he's got some meetings with the students coming up and then some of the faculty members later. So thanks again, Dan. That was great. My pleasure. Thank you all. all right. Thanks.